Next dish I'm doing is, is, is a miso marinated sable fish with an apple salad. Um, sable fish is probably, well it is actually my favorite fish. Um, it's caught locally here, um, up to Alaska, Queen Charlotte's in Alaska. Um, it has a really high oil content and it really works well with all kind of Asian flavors. Um, it's fantastic baked, it's great pan seared. It's not really the best poached, um, but it really does well um, in the oven. It's not the cheapest fish you're going to find. However, there's a cost benefit to sable fish and because it has so much oil content in it, you really can't mess it up. So you can cook it, overcook it, and it will still be delicious. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the miso marinade. So what I have is I have some miso paste. I have some mirin. Now mirin is a sweet Japanese seasoning wine. Um, you can find it in specialty Asian markets. We're going to add a little bit of sake and we're going to add white sugar. So I have this on a double boiler and I literally just have it lightly simmering. And all you need to do is simmer this long enough that the sugar is melted and it's nice and smooth. Miso. Yes. I, I like the, the, the color of it um, for marinating uh, as opposed to the dark miso. I usually do most cooking with the light miso. Um, uh, there's a little bit of a flavor difference, but not too much. It's mostly the color that I like, and I'm gonna put the miso in the dressing later as well, and I just, I like the color of the, the, lighter, the lighter one. Uh, again, you're going to find it in specialty Asian markets, um, and miso is really um, holds well in the fridge. So it's fermented soya beans, so it's already basically spoiled when you bought it. Um, keep it, uh, it comes in one kilogram bags. Um, just keep it in your fridge. It'll last, you know, probably three, four months at least. It should have an expiry date on it anyways. And there you go, that's what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for a nice smooth paste. Not really a paste, but more of a liquid. Now you wanna do is let this cool down completely so you can make this days ahead of time. And then you wanna pour it over your sable fish and let it marinate minimum 24 hours. Um, you can do it as, well, I should say minimum 12 hours up to 24 hours. Let it sit in the marinade, make sure it's fully covered in the marinade. And then after it's marinated, remove your sable fish, pat it dry, and then you're ready to bake it. So this has already been marinating for 24 hours. Um, yeah, so it's kind of gotten a little bit darker in color from the marinade. I'm gonna put it skin side down, and then we're going to bake it. Again, make sure the marinade is completely cooled, otherwise you're going to start cooking it. I have this at fairly high because I also want color on the sable fish. And that's the, with the sugar content in the sable fish, you want to make sure, or the, sorry, the sugar content in the miso, you want to kind of keep an eye on it because it will, you know, some ovens are a little warmer than others. So I'm doing this at about 375, I put it up to 400 um, and just going to keep an eye on it. If you don't get a lot of color, you can then finish it under the broiler if you want. But again, there's so much sugar in that marinade that it will burn quickly on you. Again, you can use this on salmon, halibut, whatever. If you do it with salmon and halibut, you really want to keep it no longer than six hours in the marinade. Sable fish, you can get away with it longer. This is, it's also really good with chicken. I know everybody, if you're like me, are looking for about 101 different ways of cooking chicken because of, I have two small kids. Um, they seem to like chicken. So again, it's a fantastic with chicken. Pork, miso uh, is great with pork. Um, I've taken this miso marinated and marinated a pork tenderloin for a day and then di f did it on the barbecue and then sliced it up. And the salad that we're gonna prepare is equally as good with the pork. So I always like to give lots of options um, when, for, for uh, the different dishes that we prepare. Um, sorry, when I put the sable fish in the oven, you notice that I had the white paper on there. That's parchment paper. Um, if you have non-stick baking pans, by all means, I recommend parchment paper. A, nothing sticks to it, and B, um, it's, it helps with the cleanup. So my wife is a huge fan of parchment paper. So now we're going to make our dressing for the apple salad. We have some mayonnaise. It's just a commercial Hellman's mayonnaise. I think Hellman's does a fantastic job of making mayonnaise, so um, even though I do make mayonnaise myself, um, Hellman's really does do a great job. 
Uh, we added a little bit of Dijon mustard. We're going to add our miso paste. We're going to add a little bit of sesame oil. And then we're going to give that a whisk. Oh, look at that. I'll give you that. Really simple. Again, make this several days in advance. And there we go. Now we're going to cut our ingredients for the salad. Is this on the menu at Forte's uh, No, it's not. Actually, the miso marinated sable fish is on the menu, but the apple salad we don't. I do the apple salad actually um, when we're doing functions. I actually take the sable fish really small and I bake it and I put it in Asian spoons with a little bit of apple salad on top for past canapes. But uh, we do it at Forte's with, uh, with a jasmine rice and then uh, sauteed um, shiitake mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, and a bok choy. And then we just put it on top of it. So for our apple salad, we are going to dice daikon radish. Now again, daikon radish, you can find it in a lot of, uh, you can find it at Save On Foods now and Safeway. When you're buying daikon radish, it's really just a long white radish. Here's the other half of it. It's quite gnarly, has lots of little hairs hanging out of it. When you buy daikon radish, you want it to be firm. It really tastes like a regular radish. Um, some people say it's a little bit spicier. It depends. I've had some red radishes that are really spicy and some that aren't. So again, when you buy it, you want to make sure it's nice and firm and you want to make sure it's not wilted. You want to make sure it's nice and crisp. I literally just peel it and then we're going to dice it. You could use the mandolin on this that I used earlier on today and then do it in the slices and then go along and dice it. But it also gives you a little bit of, a little bit of training working with a knife. You want a fairly small dice. You know, you don't want really big chunks in there. Now, unfortunately, you can't really make this up too much ahead of time because the apples will go brown. However, if you dress it, if you make it, let's say, an hour or two ahead of time, the dressing does um, prevent the apples from going brown a bit. So I would say you probably have you know, two hours to work with. However, the apples do have a tendency to release a fair bit of moisture, so you might need to kind of just strain off a little bit of the, uh, the juice from the salad as it sits. I like a Granny Smith in this one, again, because it's, it's got a really firm texture, and it just has a nice, uh, a nice uh, flavor profile for the salad. And I'm not peeling the apple. Um, I actually quite like the, the peel in there, but I'm not using kind of the ends a little bit. By all means, if you want to peel it, you can. There's already enough dicing in this dish, so I try to get away with. And even in the restaurants, I, we don't peel the apple when we do serve it. And I'm just using two apples for this. You know, by all means, if you want to uh, make a bigger batch of that, um, it's really actually good just as a, as a topper even on the salad. Um, you know, like that bistro slaw we made, if you wanted to put a couple spoonfuls on that, um, it's really quite nice as a added texture in a salad as well. If 
you know someone that has really good knife skills in your family, get them to dice the apples for you. All right, so there's our apples and our daikon. And now we're going to add our celery. I'm using just the heart of the celery, more of the, um, the center part of the celery, just because I like the, uh, it's a little bit more tender. Check on my sable fish. It's getting there. Then we're going to add some green onions to this salad mix. I wouldn't recommend putting any white onion in this. It would be really strong. I, lots of people have asked me if you could put white onion or purple onion in it, so I would just, I would stick with the green onion. I try to give lots of variations, but uh, white onion is probably one that I wouldn't recommend. And then that's pretty much our salad ingredients. I just want to add to the dressing yet is a little bit of the lemon juice and a little bit of the lemon zest. Oh, you know what? I do need my microplane, Mary. Is that around somewhere? Sure. Just a little bit of lemon zest in there. Do you need to add that at the last? No, I forgot to do it, actually. <laughs> I told you guys if I forgot something you, to ask me. So, you guys all failed that test. It was a test. Yeah. It's the next dish that I usually forget to put things in the prawns dish. There's so many different seasonings in it. So I usually get people, uh, you forgot to put this in there? It's hard really to kind of keep on track and you know, remember all your ingredients. Um, so what we're going to do here. Have you ever used the Asian pears? Yeah, actually Asian pears would be fantastic in there. Yep, yep. I wouldn't use a regular pear because uh, they're definitely a little too soft. So what I have here is I have some black sesame seeds. Um, by all means, you can use white. And I'm just gonna give them a really quick toast. The reason being is sesame seeds kind of have this really metallic-y flavor right out of the jar. Now you can buy, do you have uh, toasted already here? No. Oh, you don't. Um, yeah, you can buy toasted sesame seeds. I actually recommend just doing it yourself on the burner. And just, uh, or in the oven if you want, just keep in mind, if you put it in the oven, don't put your convection oven on because they'll fly around everywhere, okay? <laughs> I have. I have learned that the hard way. So, or I think one of my cooks learned that the hard way. They get really light and there is nothing left on the pan. So um, you don't need any oil, you just really want dry heat and you just want to give it a light toasting. And the w yeah, I know, that's just it. So, you know, it's always when all those kind of spices, you know, buy them, give them a quick uh, dry, you know, even cinnamon, all that kind of stuff. Uh, give it a quick dry roast in the pan. It just kind of perks the flavors up on them. Now we're gonna just check our sable fish here. So we're starting to get a little bit of color. So we might wanna finish that on the broiler, but we'll wait and see. And we're pretty much good to go there. We're going to add that to our, and you can pre, you can pre-do the sesame seeds. You don't have to do it last minute. I just like to show everybody how to quickly toast them. We're going to add the dressing to this. Is there anything else I forgot in the salad? Got it all? Perfect. Like I said, if you forgot or if you put the, did this ahead of time, you will start to see a little bit of liquid pool up around the apples. Like I said, just take it and, and lightly uh, strain it out. 
We have served this in the restaurants before, so we have made it, you know, prior to service and held it for like six hours. But like I said, as the night goes on, it has a tendency to, uh, to, to uh, release a little bit of moisture. So that's ready to go. Do you have a big spoon? So when it comes time to spoon that on. Now we're fortunate here with the sable fish today because I, uh, I got all the center cut of it, so there shouldn't be any bones, but please watch for it. Um, sable fish is one of those fish that you cannot remove the bones prior to when you're, while you're filleting it. However, the nice thing about sable fish is they have such a really thick bone in it. As you're cooking the sable fish, the bone actually kind of comes to the top, and when you can pull it out, the sable fish is generally done. Sable fish, you don't want to eat medium. You want to eat it medium well, fully cooked throughout, or you know, a real thin line of transparency. So the nice thing is, when you're, if you're cooking a whole side of sable fish, sable fish usually gets about you know, seven to 11 pounds. Um, so they're fairly good sized fish. Um, if you're cooking a whole side of it, the bones will start to kind of come to the surface and literally you can just pluck them out. So, or if you want, you take the side and you will see the bones down the middle and you can cut the bones out, but then you're left with the little tiny belly meat and it's kind of, when you're paying probably $27 a pound for sable fish, it gets a little expensive throwing out that belly meat. So I do recommend just cooking it like that and then gently plucking the bones out. And sable fish, I don't know if, you know, when you're dining out or when you're cooking at home, I don't know if any of you are too terribly concerned of where your products come from or the, the you know, the, the harvesting methods, but sable fish is one of those fish that really became popular in the late 90s when Chilean sea bass was kind of a no-no to have in your restaurant. Um, and it was basically called green black cod or black cod because there's two different types. There's a smoked variety. So if you've had smoked black cod, it's the same fish as this, one is smoked and one is not. But smoked was everywhere on the menu in the 80s, um, and then the unsmoked variety came out, and then it get, got to be popular on the menus. So that's really kind of where sable fish came when Chilean uh, sea bass was, like I said, was a no-no to have on your menu in the late 90s. Sea bass still on the at-risk list? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not as bad, but it's still, um, it's still definitely on the, on the watch list. You know, in the, in, the, in, in the restaurant business, you know, we try to balance a little bit of everything. We are part of OceanWise, so we, you know, we try to have you know, a good percentage of our product um, that is, that is OceanWise. It's not always possible, but we, we try our best. So we're just about there. Some of the smaller pieces are done. You can also, if you want, um, when you take the sable fish out, you'll see um, if it doesn't have quite the caramelized top that you're looking for, you can take a blowtorch and lightly caramelize the top. Um, just remove it from the parchment paper first though, because I've also <laughs> learned that the hard way. Um, just take it off the parchment paper. You can take a blowtorch, a propane torch. Um, I use propane torches all the time in the restaurant business for creme brulee and things like that. But you can lightly give it a, uh, a brulee on it. So if you're that adventurous. If you're not, just live with the color it is. Yeah. All right, so we're going to go. Do you have a smaller spoon? That one's a little, little, little bigger than I like. Perfect. So we're going to go and spoon a little bit of the apple salad on top. Now, perfect. Now I didn't really add salt to this, uh, mostly because miso is actually fairly salty already. Um, so I didn't really add any flavoring other than the just the the, the mayonnaise and the Dijon and the mayonnaise uh, and the uh, miso. a little bit of green onion for the garnish for the top afterwards.
So as you can see, it starts to crack a little bit. Don't worry about it. That's quite common in sable fish. It starts to kind of what I call get a little gapey. Can you tell me how to put the broiler on this? Oh, right there. Is that broiler? There we go, just leave it on high. Any questions or concerns so far with the sable fish? Perfect. So like I said, if you're doing, um, if you are going to marinate any other products, I wouldn't mar recommend marinating scallops or prawns in this, but any other fish, I would keep it no longer, no longer than six to eight hours. The sable fish definitely can go a little bit longer. It's really good on tuna as well if you want to do tuna. Just with tuna, you got to make sure you dry it really well and then you know sear it afterwards, so you don't want a lot of liquid on it when you're when you're searing it. I just find that they 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 get a little bit too moist, but they, you know if you dried it really well, um, you possibly could. I've never tried it with scallops. I've tried it with albacore tuna, um, ahi tuna, um, spring salmon, um, and halibut. So you, you maybe could do it with scallops. I've never tried it with scallops. But it, it, because there's so much oil content in scallops, it possibly would work as well. Have you done it with scallops ever? Not this oh. place. No, I do uh, different miso marinade for scallops, but it's a drier marinade. Oh, is it? It's more pasty. Yeah. And, and maybe if it was a little bit uh, drier, it might, it might work a little bit better. I would be concerned of drawing too much moisture out of the scallops, but I, I don't know what the, the dry one's like. And how long do you marinate it for in the dry one? Um, just three or four hours. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that would probably be good then, yeah. Yeah. Has anybody worked with miso? Not even in miso soup? Oh, perfect. Okay, so you've worked with miso. So we're, we're getting there. Just going to let it get a little bit further, and then we're good to go. Um, uh, salmon and halibut in the in the season. Um, sable fish, our miso sable fish is definitely up there. With uh, it's probably our you know third top seller. We have a trio right now on the menu, so it's you know um, salmon, halibut, and jumbo prawns, or sometimes we do scallops, and that's probably our top seller again because it's three varieties. And we give a good portions about three and a quarter ounces of each, so you're almost ten ounces of fish. So it's, it's, a, it's a good, and we, I bought these plates that have three separate compartments, so it really looks nice in the dining room, but that we'll sell 80, 90 a night. So we, we definitely do, uh, Joe's is kind of one of those unique restaurants. Has everybody been to Joe's? Oh, okay, so Joe's is on the corner of Robson and Thurlow. Um, it's an institution, it's been around 28 years. Um, I've been there almost three years as exec chef. Prior to that, I was at the cannery, um, and it's, it's a volume restaurant. We do, uh, in the summertime, we'll do almost 1,000 covers a day, so. We put a lot of a lot of people through the door, so um, we we move a lot of fish at Joe's. It's where all the pretty people hang out. It, it is where all the pretty people hang out. You're right, Angie. Yes. Lots of Vancouver Canucks. They have a way to get out. Yeah. Yeah. We get. Uh, it's a bit glamorous. It, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But the but the nice thing about Joe's, it is the type of restaurant you can go and have an eighty dollar entree or you can go have 24 or 1995 fish and chips anytime. So, you know, it kind of, it does cater to, you know, all sorts of, uh, you know, for menu prices. So that's, I think one thing that's unique about Joe's. And the oyster bar is excellent. The oyster bar is fantastic. And that's, that's kind of our iconic, uh, um, you know, part of Joe's is our fresh oysters. Pretty much we recommend reservations. Um, we do keep us a, a fairly, uh, you know, good sized portion open for walk-ins, um, you know, I, I'm not really sure why, but we will hit two-hour waits on a Tuesday night. So um, I, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't know why I, people would wait two hours. But um, anyways, it's just kind of one of those restaurants that people just really want to go to. So it's good for me. It's good. It, you know what? It's solid. It's, it's always consistent. Yeah. You're always going to have a great meal there. It's always good. It's a great yeah. It, it is. Yeah. It's definitely. Uh, yeah. And you can just sprinkle a little bit of green onion on there. And that's it, yeah. And the old folks love it. They do. And that's kind of, the, like I said, the, 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 yeah. Like my parents and older, they love it. It's, uh, I don't know what it is. Yeah, see, my parents love it too. They come all the time. Yeah, yeah. 
we, and we do, we do get our, you know, and I think that's what also like, it's kind of like the celebrity place to hang out. So I, I think that's kind of the draw for a lot of people. They like to come to Joe's and maybe see, you know, a celebrity there. You know, Michael Bublé's in probably once a month for sure. You know, he's, he's definitely our regular there. So that's basically our sable fish dish. Um, you know, you could have, that's kind of more the color I'm looking for. I just didn't want to wait too long. A little bit more golden. And by all means, don't eat the skin if you don't want to. Um, sable fish is also, a, is probably one of the best fish for pan searing. But when I pan sear sable fish, I like to pan sear flesh side down. So in the hot oil, it kind of gets that crispy, even though it's not the skin side, but it gets that crispy kind of texture on top. And I think it's fantastic pan seared. Do you do it in pan? Yes. Yeah, or, or just brush the, brush the fish with a very little bit of oil and put it in. Um, also, sable fish is known as butterfish, and I'm sure you can tell me why it's uh, also known as butterfish, because it's very buttery. It has that really buttery texture to it. Nice. Did you have that last time when I taught a class? No. Yeah. Like I said, it's not cheap. And I always tell people, you know what? Just cook it for you and your significant other. I wouldn't invite a whole house full over and cook sable fish. Because it can, it, it's pricey. It's, it's really expensive. I don't know why when it's something we catch wild in our backyard, but it's really, really expensive. I bought it for $5.99 a pound at Wow. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, sable fish, probably 85% of it has all been previously frozen. I get a very small window of buying it fresh. My supplier will say, you know what, I have 300 pounds of fresh sable that we're trying to, you know, um, unload because we had a rare opportunity. But again, um, you know, if you go around asking for fresh sable fish, you might find it. Um, Heather here in Langley is probably one of, you know, well, she's really the only seafood supplier out here. Um, one of the best seafood suppliers out here, that is. Um, you know, she might get it every once in a while, but it's been previously frozen. So, you know, don't hesitate buying a side frozen. It, all, it usually, you can buy it whole or in sides, you know, vacuum packed. Buy it, keep it in your freezer, and then pull it out, you know, when you, when you, when you want to um, enjoy it, uh, you know, let it thaw in the fridge. Don't don't microwave it or you know or, or run it under cold water to thaw it. But let it thaw naturally for a couple of days in your fridge, and then uh, you know there is a lot of moisture in it. So I'm sure as you're eating it, you might be seeing a little bit of moisture on the plate. Um, again, when you pan sear it, you kind of alleviate a little bit of that moisture. But I have it on seal for you. oh, will she? Yeah. Yeah, she Heather does a phenomenal job. Angie said. Oh yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. So it has that kind of a uh, little bit of salty, a little bit of sweet from the apples. How do you guys like the apple salad? And for, and, for, and for me, I, it's a texture thing. The sable fish is really nice and soft, and then you have the crunchy of the apple. So I always try to like to balance a little bit of textures, a little bit of flavor. So if you got you know, salty in the sable, the marinade, then you got a little sweet in the apples, and same with the texture. So that's what I really love about sable fish. You're right though, you didn't eat the salt in the salad. No, is it, is it fairly salty as is? Yeah. 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 yeah so you gotta be careful about that. You know, when I, when I always tell people when you're making like salad dressings, if you're tasting a salad dressing um, and it, you know, it's really bland, you definitely want to add lots of salt. You almost want to taste it and it's overly salty. Because if you're going to mix it with lettuce yet, you're going to lose that salt, uh, you know, flavor in this. You know, be careful. But um, I, I always say, you know, salad dressings and things like that should be overly seasoned. Same with a beurre blanc. I generally over season my beurre blancs. So when you take a spoonful of it, it might be, like I said, it might be overly, you know, maybe a little overpowering. But once you distribute it through your lettuce and your vegetables, it generally uh, disperses quite nicely.